It's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others. Here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode in 2018. Can you believe it? We are here with the first show of the year. It's a very exciting show. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, the beautiful Patricia Kirkman, PK, all the way from sunny Tucson. Don't tell me what the temperature is there. I may just die. No, it's okay. It's a little cool right now. <laughs> it, it was in the, it's like 71, 72. Oh, my God. Okay. But no sunshine. Oh. Not much sunshine. Oh, gee, that's a shame. Makes a difference. My heart breaks for you <laughs> in Tucson. We've been freezing to death here. We really I have. Know. Poor it's babies. Been terrible. Yes, I know. It's going to end, though, I think, after this weekend. If we all survive this weekend, we will go on to warmer temperatures. God, I hope so. Watching the ice, the firemen trying to put out a fire, and it's nothing but ice. Yeah, it's terrible. And they're dripping. I go, okay. It feels pretty good here today. It sure does. You're in the right place. That's <laughs> where you are. So we've got a great show tonight because we're talking about cannabis and spirituality with Stephen Gray. We're going to bring him on in a little while. And we're also going to be talking to Ezra Parsibuck, who is a marijuana consultant, a cannabis mm -hmm. consultant here in Massachusetts. And he's going to help us get some clarity on what's going on with these crazy laws so we'll bring Ezra on in a minute but first we got to check in with you it's a new year what's going on for us numerologically well the new year is all about partnerships teamwork being cognizant of everybody else's feelings all of us are going to walk around with this oh woe is me kind of a feeling because that sensitivity buttons pushed on everybody but the personal year or excuse me the universal month this year is a three so it's all about good communications and creativity and being able to go forward and look at all these neat things so if we tie and tie that up with a partnership and by the way partnership is the key throughout the year partners coming and partners going so you're going to read about a lot of marriages coming up in engagements in fact uh hilton paris hilton got engaged today big deal oh my god <laughs> and a Yes, at a 20 carat ring. Okay. Oh, of course. So the proper hand up. But anyway, <laughs> marriages and divorces are going to be things because partnerships, as I said, the coming and the going. So people will be tend to be a little overly sensitive, which can also make them insensitive. So if we kind of play really pretty with each other and try to make sure everybody gets their piece of the pie, help serve them, make life better, it'll be better for all of us. That sounds terrific. Well, okay, so now we know what the theme is, which is communication. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got a lot of really good paranormal stories on our Facebook page, so be yes. sure to visit us there at Supernatural Girls with a Z. Give us a like, follow us. You'll be sure to be in touch with all the things that we've got coming up. As you know, mm -hmm. PK, I got an, an inside call today from yes, one of my people. Did about the UFO stuff. Now, we're not going to talk about it right now, but we are going to talk about it next week. So uh, be sure to, again, keep tuning into our Facebook page. Go to our website, supernaturalgirls.com, to sign up for our newsletter, The Fringe Files. We're going to have lots of new information coming out. Also about how to form your own spirit team. We have got the best stuff coming up, always the best guests on our show, and, of course, the best audience. So we're going to jump right in tonight. We are just mm -hmm. jumping in, and we're going to introduce you to Ezra Parsons. Buck. Again, he is a cannabis consultant here in Massachusetts. Ezra, welcome to the show. Hi, Patricia and Patricia. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Great to have you well, here. I'm Great. Lucky to have you this evening to yes. dispel some of this confusion um, so many of us are going through. It's a mess. It's a mess. Now, I know we were talking off the air, PK and I and, and all of you, about 
the fact that it has become legal for recreational use in Massachusetts. It's been legal for medical use now for what, two years has it been? Uh, since 2012. 2012? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Though, but there were no uh, dispensaries. <laughs> so right. We didn't have dispensaries for the third year after legalization. It was a very, very slow rollout, and it still is. In fact, there's there should be 35 uh, full open dispensaries, one for each county, and I mm -hmm. believe there's only 12 that, that have gotten open. So it's just been a very slow process. It seems that way, and it seems like the regulations are very, very strict, and also that people don't know what really is going on with the recreational aspect that became legal mm -hmm. this year. So we were hoping you could enlighten our audience, because we've had a lot of questions from people and wanted to know when we were going to have you back to talk right. about this very subject. So if you can, enlighten us as best you can with what's yeah. happening. I, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So, yes, the the medical law, so medical marijuana passed in 2012, uh, a lot more strict. Uh, you had to be a patient. You had to get registered by a doctor. And um, it was partly why the recreational law passed is because the rollout was so slow. And it was the it was rolled out by the Department of Public Health, which for decades has been anti-marijuana. So they, they didn't really have much incentive to just make it roll out as, as fast as they could. And the the code was very stringent. Now, uh, as far as recreational, um, they are, they've put in a, a timeline so that this doesn't happen. So they are actually moving forward a little faster, even though we passed it you know, last year. And, and so when, when is it going to happen? Uh, it's not like June, uh, J January 1st hit, uh, you know, two days ago, and we think, okay, great, we'll just go to a shop and buy. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, the way it works is that the regulations will be presented uh, by March 1st so that everyone knows all the hoops they have to jump through in order to open a shop, open a cafe, um, start their own cultivation site, uh, start a delivery service. Um, there's all kinds of possible um, you know, businesses that can be created. Um, then on April 1st, they'll be accepting applications for these businesses. And I believe there's five classes of business. So um, there's the uh, cafe, the cultivation, the retail, um, the um, uh, so those are the three main ones. And then there's sort of uh, different subcategories, like are you a micro business? Are you going to be a big business? Are you more ancillary? So there's a lot of opportunities for <laughs> investors and business people here, which is interesting. But what about just the average person? I mean, they don't know what's legal and what isn't. And as we discussed before, some people, at least in Connecticut, are being arrested even though they shouldn't be getting arrested. That's right. It's a very bizarre legal area that's actually going to go forward for possible possible years. So right now, if you're over 21 in the state of Massachusetts, you can possess cannabis up to uh, one ounce. Um, actually, it might be two ounces now. If you're a medical patient, you can possess 10 ounces. Uh, you can grow it in your home. You can grow up to 12 plants per household. Uh, you can give it away to friends, and actually, you can procure it. So the idea is that you can still purchase it if you're an adult, but it's illegal to sell it. <laughs> so that's a weird gray area. Uh, but now you have, yes, so you have people who you could be a person who uh, grows your own marijuana, uh, maybe you make some brownies, uh, you know, you process it, you make some brownies, you're traveling to your friend's house uh, for a party, and everything's completely legal. You get pulled over by the police if he smells that the pot, if he smells pot brownies and he sees that you have 25 brownies, he could say, well, that, that's, uh, those are packaged for individual sale, or that you could sell those. And so I'm going to arrest you for intent to sell. Uh, oh, my eating. God. No that's business. just so counterproductive to what all of this is about. Yeah. So I've been working with lawyers. One of the things I do is consult with lawyers and, and, and defendants in these cases. And it is it is very crazy because some of them are just truly legitimate patients. They have a legal amount in their possession. But either the police, and I don't want to disparage anybody, I think everybody's sort of doing the best they can. Occasionally you have police who are just, they're old school, 
they see marijuana and they just think it's bad, and so they try and throw the book at, at the people. I, I've had cases too, where a guy has caught with one joint, and they go back to his house and search his whole house. Oh my that God. is that is a That's major crazy. violation. So yeah. it, education needs to happen, and and mm -hmm. also so even uh, so, uh, so when they um, the idea is this year. Uh, July 1st, the first shops will open for people over 21. But even then, you could buy cannabis from a shop and then be driving down the road, and if you get pulled over, and if the cop thinks you intend to sell that, if you try to make your own money uh, selling it, you could get arrested and go to jail for it because we still have laws on the books against uh, selling if you don't have a license to sell marijuana. So it's a it's a very confusing law. Basically, the state is trying to create a situation where there's so many hoops to jump through so that it deters people from trying to do an underground business and also incentivizes them on some level to say, all right, well, we're presenting you with the hoops, so just jump through them and then we won't arrest you. Oh, dear God. You see where I wanted us run the show, PK? This is yes. the reason. Yeah. Good Lord. Uh, uh, in their, to their credit, uh, they are also trying to do a few things that uh, that many people in the industry are worried about. One one is this idea of big marijuana. So it's these huge corporations that have tons of funding, and they can go in and they send their team of lawyers in, and they don't have any problem jumping through all these hoops. Um, you know, double security systems and a camera has to. Uh, be at every single angle in your establishment, and you have to track your marijuana via video from the point it's planted as a seed all the way till it arrives at the customer. Uh, so in order to prevent the big guys from getting all the money, they are creating a craft marijuana co-op cooperative and micro business uh, mm -hmm. categories so that you can have a smaller business. Um, but still, you have to have dual security teams, and you have to have... And you have to have good lawyers. Let's good lawyers, it. and if you can't get it... Make yeah. a misstep, you could be in big trouble. Well, exactly. I wanted to just, uh, Ezra, please give people your website so they can find you uh, if yep. they have questions. Um, they can they can contact you directly. What is your website? It is now EzraHelps.com. So you can just email me Ezra at EzraHelps.com. You can find me online. I have a tons I have tons of information for patients or for people who are Great. interested in that blog posts. So EzraHelps.com is the easiest way to find me. Okay, we're going to have you back on when your book is out, Ezra. Yes. So thank you so much for joining us to help clarify this uh, Michigash that's going on. Sure. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Take care and have a great okay. night. Good thank you, Ezra. Good night, stay Ezra. warm. <laughs> you definitely stay warm. Oh, my goodness. So let's now move to spirituality and cannabis mm -hmm. because that is really the topic for tonight's show and this is something that has not really been addressed except by our amazing guest tonight Stephen Gray who wrote this book Cannabis and Spirituality it is a very rich book it is it well is done he has many excellent book <laughs> really the many book ends here. people in this uh, in this book have contributed to it so let's um, let me just tell you a little bit about Stephen because he is a teacher and writer on spiritual subjects and sacramental medicines. He has worked extensively with Tibetan Buddhism, the Native American Church, and with ethiogenic, entheogenic medicines. He's also the author of another book, Returning to Sacred World, a spiritual toolkit for the emerging reality. He's also a conference and workshop organizer, leader, and speaker as well as a part-time photographer. What does this guy not do? Okay. Well, let's get him on the show. Oh, Stephen, hi. welcome to Supernatural Girls. Ah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect. Can you hear perfectly. I, I unmuted my mic. Oh, you did yourself. Yay. <laughs> Good job. All by myself, yeah. Amazing. So tell us a little bit about how you got into the spiritual side of working with cannabis. What attracted you to this topic? Uh, okay, well, I guess I have to go right back to the late 1960s for that, because uh, I'll try to keep this short. Uh, it's not my nature to do that, but uh, um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the the shortest version I can I can make it is that 
there was an explosion of interest in both spirituality and psychedelics in the late 1960s in the in North America and other places and cannabis uh, was sort of dragged along uh, into that in a way uh, you know a whole new generation of people uh, this baby boom generation uh, demographic uh, you know, suddenly out of nowhere more or less started to smoke cannabis as well and so uh, I was interested in all of that I was interested in the spiritual side of it much of the spirituality was focused toward Asia uh, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, for example, uh, and the the use of psychedelics, uh, LSD being the main one at that time, but certainly not the only one, uh, was associated with that spirituality for a lot of people, certainly not for everybody, but I became very interested in that and rec you know began to see that there was the, a whole other dimension to life that far exceeded what uh, most people had experienced or even heard about uh, that could be opened up potentially through the use of psychedelics um, and then what happened was there was a I guess you'd call it a meme going around in what we called the counterculture at the time mm -hmm. uh, this group of people now often referred to as hippies uh, which was uh, okay you've you've um, you've had an opening of some kind or another and now what are you going to do with it you can't just take LSD for the rest of your life every day uh, unless your name is Timothy Leary but that's another right. story um, yes. uh, uh, <laughs> didn't necessarily help uh, in that regard anyway more seriously uh, the, <clears throat> the 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 idea or the meme that came along at that time was uh, you need a daily path of some kind or another so I got involved with uh, that for me that became Tibetan Buddhism that went on for quite a while until Terence McKenna do you guys know who Terence McKenna is so tell us who Terence McKenna is. Okay, well he could have a whole inter uh, in a whole you know hour just to talk about him, but he he was um, he was the number one uh, philosopher philosopher spokesperson for psychedelics uh, starting in about the 1980s and influenced a lot of people. He passed away I think in 2000, um, uh, but his he still you can find his uh, YouTube videos all over the place um, uh, very interesting guy and he had gone to South America and discovered that people had been using substances like ayahuasca for thousands of years but always never recreationally or you know maybe there was the odd rogue you know but basically they always used them either ceremonially or for healing purposes that's what a shaman is a healer um, mm -hmm. and so he kind of put those two together for me because the Tibetan Buddhist community that I was involved with didn't have anything to do with psychedelics and didn't encourage them uh, so uh, but I always remembered there was this spiritual potential with those substances so that's how I got back into it again uh, and then uh, that led to me eventually becoming uh, connected to a conference up here that I've been co-organizing for seven years called the spirit plant medicine conference and I'm giving you I'm like I said I'm trying to keep it short but it doesn't <laughs> It doesn't well, usually work. A long journey with this, it sounds like, yeah. which is good. Uh, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm leading up to the sort of the key moment, so to speak, uh, the, the climax of the story for <laughs> yes, uh, which was <laughs> waiting to hear it. Yes, one, one of the people that uh, we had at the conference is Kathleen Harrison, who's a remarkable person. She was actually married to this uh, Terence McKenna for 15 years, but she's a she's a world class ethnobotanist, teacher, um, and a great elder spokesperson for the psychedelics. And she and I were having a conversation because I'm the one, uh, still am the one who often finds the speakers for the conference. So she and I, and I were talking. I told her that I thought cannabis, uh, while it was becoming more and more popular and spreading across the cultures, there was this one side of it that I had found out about through reading and so on, which was that it had an ancient history as a spiritual medicine, really ancient, you know, 10,000 years at least. That's just what we know. Um, but that it wasn't getting that attention as it burgeoned in, you know, recreational and medical uses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I said that I didn't think I had a whole book in it in myself to write. Uh, and she said to me, well, you know, if you put that together as a project, I would promise to contribute a chapter to it. And she's a very wise person and a beautiful writer, and that was the trigger for me. That was five years ago. So then I ended up gathering a total, counting me, of 18 contributors to the book. Uh -huh. 
And to answer a question that you haven't specifically asked yet, um, the mission... <laughs> The mission of the book is to redress that issue uh -huh. that cannabis, when used carefully, when used wisely, respectfully, responsible, responsibly, with knowledge about how to use it, because we consider it an advanced spiritual medicine, uh, and not, uh, and, you know, it's not like you just t take a pill and, you know, the world opens up necessarily. There are ways to use it, and, and so that's what the purpose of the book is. Well, we need this. It's, it's, it's so necessary, I think, with everybody having this uh, to deal with from the legal side, the medical side, the recreational mm -hmm. side. This has been the missing piece. Now, here's an interesting question from our chat room for you, Graham. Uh, this gentleman says, why did indigenous tribes even consider to use these drugs as part of their ceremonies? Hmm. Like, how did they know to use it? Oh, well, gee, that's a tough question. I, I think um, ethnobotanists would be able to answer that one pretty well oftentimes. Uh, my understanding, and I think this is, you know, close enough to the truth to be useful, uh, is that uh, before we had uh, grocery stores, uh, which was for most of our history until extremely recently, uh, y you needed to know the uses of every plant in your neighborhood. You needed to know if it could be used for a building material, uh, if it could be used for clothing, uh, for medicine, you know, to eat it. And uh, they weren't necessarily looking for plants that would uh, have a, a, a spiritual opening potential, but if they ate those plants, such as mushrooms or different things like that, um, they would certainly find out. And cannabis certainly sits into that category because it's been around for, well, the family from which it comes has been around for at least 30 million years on the planet. Wow, uh, incredible. And so, you know, if you're in China, where they think it may have originated from, northeastern China perhaps, and you see this plant around, you're going to find out that what you can do with it. And if you, you know, if you were to make it into a tea or, you know, something like that, you'd certainly find out what it can do, right? So that's one part of the answer. The other sort of you know, grossly oversimplified version of the answer to your question about, you know, in, or that person's question about, you know, why would indigenous people, you know, use these plants is, is is really difficult to answer and you know I don't think anyone now would know for sure but uh, it seems to me I've read a fair amount of anthropological literature and so on um, that most peoples were had an there was a I don't know how to put this exactly really simply the the um, uh, wall, so to speak, between uh, the spirit world and the material world was pretty thin uh, for a lot of cultures, a lot of communities mm -hmm. throughout history. And so even without the use of um, you know, medicinal plants or whatever, people were often uh, in contact with spirits you know, of one kind or another, you know, whether you want to call that God or guardian angels or in some cases right. even, even demonic sense demonic energies even, you know. Uh, so when people found out that they could open those doors wide or, you know, with the use of certain specific plants, they would do that. Uh, um, here's, here's perhaps a summing up of that answer. Uh, I think I actually quoted this fellow in my first book who was a shaman from Peru, and he was at a conference, and he said, you know, we don't have a problem with Western science in, a, in one sense, like we appreciate the things that Western science has learned about med medical issues, but it's only half of the answer. The other half is spirit, that when you use a plant for medicinal purposes or any purposes, healing purposes, you ideally, and this is what I think indigenous people would say all over the world, you connect with the spirit of that plant so that you bring that in. And ayahuasca, exactly. you, you know, you mentioned yes. ayahuasca before we started mm -hmm. the conversation on air here. Uh, the well-trained ayahuasqueros, the shamans or whatever you want to call them, uh, they know that they're going to be calling on the spirit or spirits uh, to help with the work that they're doing. That's what those Icaros are about, mm -hmm. for example. They're, I've, I've been told by a, a shaman in South America, an ayahuasca shaman, that the songs are actual beings, in a sense, that mm. you, you learn those songs by contacting spirit, and they teach them to you, and then when you're doing your work in the ceremony, a song will come in and, in a sense, say, I'm the song for this situation now. 
right? Um, and they have immense power that way. So I'm you know, getting perhaps a little off the, the cannabis topic here, but uh, no, but that's but, okay because I think yeah. what you're addressing is what our audience wants to hear, which is how yeah. do you connect with the plant spirit? How do you connect? Mm -hmm. You know, with this medicine for the soul, basically, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then this, you know, where does it take you next? I mean, this is a very fascinating topic for everybody in our audience tonight. Now, here's another question. This is from Bluebird, who wants to know: I'd like to know if any of these plants are protected by local governments in certain mm -hmm. parts of the world. Hmm. Well, we're definitely getting beyond just the cannabis issue here. Um, uh, so maybe, maybe I'll just briefly say that uh, uh, I think that within maybe 20 years or so, uh, cannabis is going to be legal in a great number of jurisdictions. Right now, Uruguay has made it uh, legal um, for their own citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Portugal has decriminalized all psychedelics, all drugs, essentially. Um, Europe is in various stages of moving toward this. Canada is about to have across the board federal, federally approved legalization for all uses of marijuana for adults. Um, the United States, as I'm sure you, you know, most of your listeners know, has <laughs> at least six states uh, with uh, with uh, recreational. Uh, legal marijuana and 30 I believe it is with medical marijuana legalized uh, so it's changing rapidly and uh, and so that's that I think we can be optimistic about uh, because it's going to what people are going to find out is it's not near, nearly the big deal that everyone was you know in, in positions of conservative authority so to speak were concerned about it'll just be kind of you know a normal thing after a while you know Holland for example has had de facto legalization of cannabis, not actual legalization because they're part of the EU and it's not allowed, the mm -hmm. European Union. Mm -hmm. But they've they they have these, you know, quote unquote coffee shops and they've had them for forty or, or more years. And so uh, it's it's not stigmatized there essentially and it's easily accessible. And the percentage of the population that uses cannabis is significantly lower than it has been all of these years in Canada and the United States, where it's been illegal, right? So right. My, my, my take on that is that once, this, once the novelty is passed, once the stigma is out of the way, and it's been around for a while, it'll kind of settle, things will settle down, you know, laws will relax a little more, people will be able to decide for themselves, and a lot of people will just go, well, okay, I, it's not actually, my, it's not the plant for me, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's cannabis. Um, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, I, except for, you know, again, places like Portugal where they've decriminalized all drugs, uh, I don't believe uh, I know of any jurisdictions where that is legal now. Um, ayahuasca is a really interesting one uh, because there are churches uh, that stem from Brazil. There are at least three of them. The best known is called the Santo Daime religion, um, and they have many, many adherents, and they've been spreading around the world, and they've been gaining levels of legal recognition. They're, they they won a Supreme Court decision in Oregon, for example, where a very particular church uh, has been given permission to legally have their ceremonies with ayahuasca. Uh, mm. They call it the daimi. They call the medicine the daimi. Um, mm. And uh, there, there's moves toward that in Can Canada. There, I don't specifically know, but there are jurisdictions in Europe, I think, that are kind of close to that at this point. Um, then there's the the peyote. Yes, medicine. that's another one. Well, we're going to yeah. get get to all of the spiritual side of this and how people uh -huh. can do this, how they can, if this is something for them, then, uh -huh. uh, and again, like you said, for some people this is not a good thing, but right. there are people who this will really work for and connect to a spiritual soul path like none other. So we're going to get to all of that. We're going to take a very short commercial break, and we will be right back. So listen, everybody, this is a great show. You're going to learn a lot from Stephen Gray. He's the author of the book, Cannabis and Spirituality. 
he's actually the editor, but he also has his own chapter in here that he wrote. He's so we're gonna, <laughs> that's a beautiful book. So we're going to come back and and just unwrap all of this beautiful information. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio, and we will be right back. Natural Girls Radio. I'm your host Patricia Baker. I'm here with my lovely co-host from Tucson, PK. You can visit PK online at patriciakirkman.com if you want to see what's coming up for you in 2018. She is the woman to speak with. So go to patriciakirkman.com. So tonight we are having a very interesting discussion yes. with a lot of information and it's about cannabis and spirituality and now we're going to go more into spiritual awakening mm -hmm. spiritual awakening how does that happen with cannabis Stephen? can you talk to us about that sure so i think the first thing that i want to say to lay the ground for that is you know i wouldn't say that i'm late i haven't reached the end of the line so to speak but i have been working with spiritual for many, many years, and meditation and so on, as well as uh, various psychedelics or entheogens, as people prefer to call them. Uh, and I've certainly read a lot as well. Uh, my sense of what spiritual awakening is, is that there is a an unconditioned reality that has nothing to do with belief about what is true or not true, or real or not real, or good or bad. Yeah, you know, Stephen, we're having a little bit of what, trouble. Yeah. Stephen, if you could just hang on for a second. We're having a little problem technically. Um, I don't know if your Internet okay. connection is overloaded, uh, but let's see if we can maybe start over because that you broke up through that right. explanation of spiritual awakening. So let's try this again and see if we can hear what you have to say. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I felt like that I should start with start my with understanding of what spiritual awakening is. And that comes from a lot of study and practice. Uh, and my sense is, my understanding is that there is something that you could call unconditioned or unconditional reality that every human being is capable of, in a sense, falling into or relaxing into. It's not something that you create, in a sense. It's something that you remove obstacles to. And that's what, uh, that's what the word Buddha actually means. Uh, Buddha means awake. And the Buddhist teachings say that everybody has Buddha nature. Okay, so that's that's the the kind of the ground and the reason that people are not what you might call awake or enlightened is because we create a whole bunch of obstacles for ourselves through our the stories that we tell ourselves, the beliefs and concepts that we ship on from you know the people around us as we're growing up and develop into our own narrative about who we are what's real, what's not real, and so on, right? What's true, untrue, Yes, that, good. that happens to each mm -hmm. of us, right. Yeah, but that's what you might call a fictional, that's, you know, the Buddhist teachings call it an illusion, an illusion of, of this, of the separate self that's disconnected from, uh, you know, from everything. All, you know, that's what they mean when they talk about oneness, that when you are able to let go, surrender, release these um, you know, boundaries and uh, walls and bonds that we kind of place around ourselves, then you start to discover that you actually are more, you, you gradually usually discover that you're connected to everything in that sense and that at the root of that is uh, an unconditioned, unambiguous sense of peace. That's what the word peace actually means, is that you can, you can just settle down into this place that's real. And it, uh, Buddhist teachings also say that enlightenment, a synonym for that is awakened heart. So your heart wakes up with that too, and you develop unconditional compassion or unconditioned compassion. So with that as a kind of a ground, the question is then, well, how could cannabis help with that, right? So yes. uh, the starting point is, is to de describe it as an amplifier. Uh, what you might call a non-specific amplifier. So you might say it's a gift of, of, of amplified, uh, uh, sharper, vaster energy in a sense that if you do it well, and we can talk about that, I think we should talk about that as we go forward here. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you use it properly, if you understand the principle of what you're doing that can um, deepen and expand whatever your intention is. 
So that's another issue that we could probably should probably talk about as we go along too, is that if your intention is either unconscious or uh, consciously just to escape, cannabis can amplify that kind of intention as well. However, if your intention is to uh, wake up, to heal, then it can open you up in that way. It can deepen your experience. So I think an important thing to, to, uh, to point out, well, for those who are interested at least, is you know, how that works biochemically. Uh, it's referred to as the pharmacokinetics. Um, pharmacokinetics means the, the action of a drug or substance as it enters the body, how it's processed in the body, and how it leaves the body. So um, uh, one of the chapters in the book is by Joan Bellow, who has a very interesting description of how that works. And she says that when you first smoke it or vaporize it, um, uh, edible uh, uh, oral ingestion being a different case altogether because it can take up to two hours to uh, reach full effects when you take it orally. But if you smoke or vaporize cannabis, uh, the effects are to all intents and purposes immediate, you know, within seconds or a minute or two or whatever. And so when you do that, uh, your heart speeds up somewhat. There's an increase in heart rate that's well known and well recorded. And uh, a subsequent pumping of fresh, rich, freshly oxygenated blood throughout the organism uh, and a concomitant um, relaxing of the skeletal or oppositional muscles. That's Joan Bellow's phrase for it, skeletal oppositional muscles. So the whole organism is, becomes more highly charged. If you're paying attention to it, as everybody who has ever been around cannabis either for themselves or other people knows, you can distract yourself and you can just busy your mind, you can do have things going on all the time, but if you more or less kind of sit down, shut up and pay attention, which is a phrase from Terence McKenna who I mentioned earlier, um, uh, then you, you can see that it can potentially, it has a lot to do with getting out of your head, right? So if you can, and this is a basic spiritual principle anyway, uh, you know, Buddhism and other traditions talk about getting out of your own way, letting go of this narrative that I mentioned a few moments ago of thoughts constantly coming through. In fact, Buddhist teachings say that our thoughts are the primary kind of strategy or tactic that we use to um, create and preserve this fortress, this wall that we create around ourselves so that we can maintain this seemingly comforting illusion of this separate self. So cannabis can help dissolve that the hard you know, wall. That, yeah the, the walls mm -hmm. the hardness the bonds etc etc but again mm -hmm. it needs to be channeled that way so if you understand or accept this principle of the non-specific amplifier then the next question for me is how do you apply that you know so I mentioned the sit down shut up and pay attention idea <laughs> that's essentially another that's a synonym for meditating really um, and when I say meditating I don't mean contemplating I mean what Buddhist teachings and others would refer to as meditation which is um, the simplest version is you just sit you try to sit up straight so that your energy moves easily you know what some people might call the kundalini energy or whatever and right. you're not going to you're not going to tire as fast as you would if you're slouching over or whatever and you just pay attention so uh, in the way meditation was taught to me um, you use the breath as the as the the anchor back into reality because it's part of the autonomic nervous system it it you don't think about your breath most of the time right and right. Uh, so so if you pay attention to it in a in a light way not over hyper focus but just it brings you back into the full presence of this moment and then inevitably thoughts come up you're off in never never land or whatever thinking about tomorrow yesterday or whatever and then when you recognize that you just kind of let it go and come back to being present well now do you that, do, let me just let me just yeah, interrupt for a second because i know what yeah. our audience is thinking about here and so do you do your meditation um on the heels of taking marijuana, I mean, I'm taking cannabis. Is that how you do this, or do you use it after your meditation? How? What are the mechanics of it? That's what they want to know. Well, one answer to that question is that it's, uh, as is, as is said a few times in the book, it's the people's plant. So it's very amenable and gracious to experimenting with. So there's lots of different ways to work with the plant that way. Um, uh, in, I just wanted to say about meditation is that. 
um, the idea is that as much as possible we open a gap in the ongoing thinking mind, right? And then right. we gradually, hopefully, um, surrender or relax into the unconditioned awakened state uh, and in degrees. And so what cannabis being a non-specific amplifier can actually uh, heighten uh, and deepen that process. Okay, so yes, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, for example, you might meditate for a while first, just to calm yourself down. And it, it's not just meditation. This is just kind of. I, I like to think of uh, this simple kind of follow the breath kind of med meditation as the sort of the purest uh, way of working with it, because everybody has so much of an issue with the thinking mind that. Mm -hmm. If we can simplify our, our you know, the container, you might say, that we're in and, and remove distractions and just sit down, shut up, and pay attention, then we can really find out what this medicine can do when you get out of your own way. So you might meditate for a while first. You might do some other calming practices, yoga, tai chi, whatever. You, that's one way you could do it. Um, and and you might and you might uh, as Kathleen Harrison in her chapter makes a point of saying, you might treat it with great respect. And, and if you do that, you're more likely to receive benefit from the plant. If you treat it even, even though you might not have a, had experience with it as a spirit or, you know, anything like that. You, if you if you think maybe you know just kind of like a fake it till you make it kind of approach. It's like, <laughs> what if there is, what if there is a spirit behind this plant? Because as Kathleen Harrison says indigenous people that she's known. She's a world-renowned, in certain circles, um, ethnobotanist and has spent much time with indigenous people and who those people would say things like, there's a mother of every plant species. It's like the uh, overseeing spirit in the sense of that plant species and it's possible to contact that spirit. And I could, if we had time, I could tell you some stories about people who say they have contacted the spirit of, of cannabis in that regard. And yeah, uh, can you give us one of those stories? What is that like? I mean, when they have that experience of reaching out that way and they actually make contact. Okay, I'll tell you my favorite one then. Um, there's, there's a, he was a leader of a spiritual community that worked with ayahuasca in Brazil, and they were way out in the jungle. This was back in the 70s, I believe, and uh, he did not—he was not familiar with cannabis. It wasn't around there, uh, but but um, this community was starting to get known, and sometimes people would just show up. And some young hippie guy arrived at his encampment and had some uh, pot with him, and felt kind of embarrassed about it. So he went to the leader guy and said. Uh, you know, I've got this stuff with me. I'm not sure what I should do with it. I don't want to be disrespectful. And the leader said, oh, well, give it to me, and I'll find out for myself. <laughs> so he went and had a little private one, you know, solo ceremony with it. <laughs> and he said that he had a vision. Oh. Uh, and, and the vision was that he found himself in a garden, and there was a woman tending the garden. And she saw him there, and she turned to him and said, this is, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, she said to him, uh, you're in my garden. This is my garden. And that plant that you smoked, that's my plant. And it's here in my garden. And if you choose to, in your position of responsibility, what you could do is help people understand that this is actually a spiritual medicine and that a lot of people don't understand that and misuse it. And it actually can be harmful in their lives if they misuse it. So it needs to be returned to its 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 proper role, which is as a sacred medicine that belongs to the spirit in a sense. Um, and so because this community that he was involved in was syn a syncretic religion that in included indigenous components as well as Christian elements, he dubbed her Santa Maria, Saint Mary. And mm. so they, they actually call cannabis Santa Maria now. So they actually call oh, it by the, by the name of a saint. That's right? fascinating, yes. Yeah. Um, That's a great so, story. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that. So then, coming back to the practice element, if I may, uh, the simplest way to meet cannabis, and and in a sense, the most difficult, because it is an advanced spiritual medicine. It is raising the stakes. It's an amplifier, you know, and so it's actually a challenge to do that. It's it's like meditation plus or something in a sense, you know. It's the same principle. It's the same trajectory. It's the same practice. But it can be more challenging because it actually wants to dissolve this, you know, illusory, uh, you know, structure that you've built, you know, and soften you up that way. But if you can do that, then there's much, 
reward that can come of it. So, so simply sitting down for part of the time at least that you work with cannabis and doing a, some, some kind of simple meditation can be very, very useful, I think. But it can also uh, help with a variety of other what you might call more form-based practices like yoga, tai chi, and some others. I just hope that people will let go of their dogma, like, oh, no, no, we can't mix those, you know. There's, people are like <laughs> that, you know, like, oh, no, God, my God, you can't corrupt Tai Chi by having cannabis or a drug involved. But if you just treat it as a spirit, as a respectful sacred plant, and think of it as a neutral substance, a non-specific amplifier, it can deepen your practice if you can do it with some kind of channeled focus, intention, and discipline in that regard. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question, Stephen. This, cause there are, as you know, a lot of people now, you mentioned 30 states, um, that have it as uh, legal for medical use. Now, what I'm thinking is there's absolutely no reason why people who are using it to alleviate pain or seizures or whatever the issue is that they're using this for, they can also incorporate this spiritual element to their use. So they can also, if they so choose, take it beyond the medical use into when they're administering it in whatever form. They can also set their intent. They can also be open to this spiritual awakening, right? Of course, yeah. Um, I think an important point about that, and it's a difficult one, because if you're using uh, cannabis for medicinal reasons, you may have to be using it not just daily, but several times a day. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, nobody sh should be, uh, you know, chastised or questioned about that kind of use. However, um, uh, what a number of the contributors to the book all feel or believe from their experience is that if you can use it less frequently, it's going to likely be more effective as a spiritual medicine in terms of being able to go deeper with it because there's a, a tolerance effect uh, that most people experience when you use it daily and mm -hmm. uh, can, and so the sharpness and the depth of it can be missing in that way it's a, it's a bit tricky you know in that regard because i know people personally who who are not using it for what you might narrowly define as medicinal use but do do it every day and uh, I, can't, I, I can't say that I, there's some, you know, as I say, personal friends that uh, use it that way, and they're very effective in their lives. They're not slouches. They're not, you know, falling into the couch, you know, eating pizza, drinking beer, and watching television. They're, 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 they're uh, compassionate, compassionate, intelligent, active human beings. You know, so that's one thing that cannabis can do for some people is. Okay, so one thing I didn't talk about with the, um, uh, the pharmacokinetic function is mm -hmm. that it tends to balance, Joan Bellow talks a little bit about this as well in the book, but also other people have talked about it. Um, it tends to balance the blood flow to both brain hemispheres and uh, generate a condition of homeostatic balance. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Melamede calls it a homeostatic regulator of cells and society, but that's another issue. Um, uh, and so uh, it can just take the edge a little off a little for some people if they're using it right, if they're using it like they're not getting blasted, right? We're talking about maybe having one or two puffs early in the day and then they go on about their day and then maybe they have a top up in the afternoon and the evening. Uh, I, I'm, I'm leery about uh, I don't want to encourage people to do that in general because it's so easy to become dependent, what people would call addicted to this plant, um, because mm -hmm. it's so seductive. And that's that's part of the kind of like almost, uh, what do you call it, almost like a catch-22 that, you know, mm -hmm. you might have these beautiful experiences with it. Uh, I have frequent beautiful experiences with this plant. And, uh, you know, who wouldn't want to go back to a, a beautiful experience, you know? It enhances your appreciation of many things, music, you know, the munchies, food, you know, and uh, <laughs> right. uh, visual acuity is enhanced, you know, you look at a painting and you go, wow, I never saw the things in that painting that, that I'm seeing right now, you know. Um, it can induce great levels of appreciation, and that's why I wanted to mention the biochemical function, because you could say that the, the, the chemical reason for that is that it opens up these channels, it sends a fresh oxygen oogenated blood throughout the system right so yes. um, it very is very possible 
Yeah, so, but it's very possible to be seduced by that and want to keep going back to it all the time. And that can have not only diminishing returns, but it can also lead to a pattern of, of, of what you might call addiction or dependence. And that's not necessarily healthy. Again, I just want to say, though, that some people mm -hmm. are able to manage that in a healthy way daily on a daily basis and it just kind of settles them down into a groove you know and so that's up to individuals uh, it's the people's plan I just think people should be aware that it's very uh, easy to, to get seduced especially it seems younger people and you know uh, adolescents and early adults mm -hmm. oftentimes can get seduced into uh, into using it that way Kathleen Harrison I, I really recommend people mm -hmm. looking at her chapter in the book because she's very clear on that she's got about a page and a half in her chapter where she talks about how some people don't want to come back out of that space into what she called the daylight world of responsibility and relationship and they become more wedded to the plant mm -hmm. than they are wedded to their relationships in their life that can be a problem yeah. and it can be a chronic problem some people you probably know yourself have fallen yeah. into that pattern for yeah. decades decades sure and right? and people yeah. done it with alcohol you know where alcohol exactly. becomes bigger than them so mm -hmm. you know with yeah. any type of, of uh, drug like cannabis and that can become bigger than them and so it doesn't have a, a reasonable space in their lives it becomes mm -hmm. just an overwhelming issue mm -hmm. rather than it has its own space so yeah I mean this is a wonderful explanation of how to yes, go yeah. about this of how to work with this responsibly you know if you do know that you have addiction problems this may not be for you so you have to know something about yourself when it comes to substances right. and yeah. and you have to be willing to say no this isn't for me and and that's it if that is the truth so you've got yeah. to find that truth about yourself first before you take any steps towards this whether it's legal or not I mean you still have to know yourself well enough to do this responsibly and you did mm -hmm. say that um, except we're going to take the medical stuff and put it aside and just say if you're doing this for spiritual purposes the recommendation is not to do this every day, right? Yeah, again, without being hard and fast about it, uh, because if if I asked my friend that I was referring to one person in particular a few moments ago, the way she uses it uh, daily, she would probably disagree with me because she just she gets a lot done. Um, she's an open-hearted person. Um, I don't. I'm not aware. I could be naive in certain situations, but I'm not aware of any downsides for her using it that way. And again, but I want to be careful about that with your listeners because that's not necessarily the case for 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 everybody by any means. This is a person right. who's very active in life. She's holding down three jobs. She's one of the co-organizers of our conference. She's a she's a cannabis ceremony leader, and she also leads cacao ceremonies, and she does private work with people using other psychedelics she's what you might call a fairly well processed human being and she knows how to use her medicines and channel them so that's something again another way of talking about effective skillful use of cannabis is to uh, talk about channeling that amplified energy right uh, with proper yeah. intent and everything else so we're going yeah. to get back to talking about more of this we've got more questions from our chat room participants thank you so much uh, guys and gals for sending those over we're going to try to get to them in the next segment and in the meantime we're going to take a short commercial break and we will be right back this is Supernatural Girls Radio Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, here on January 3rd, 2018. I'm here with my co-host, Patricia Kirkman PK, all the way from sunny Tucson, and we are so jealous because it's in the 70s there while we are in yes. single digits in New England. And anyways, we are talking to a great guest tonight, Stephen Gray. Yes, he is the are. author of a new book cannabis and spirituality and we're learning yes all about how to work with this plant this sacred plant this sacrament to reach enlightenment to take away the matrix that we've been hooked into for however many years and finally get some freedom here so here's a question uh, that came up 
uh, for you, Stephen, and it's from Rohan Lewis who's asking, Hello, Stephen, can you please explain what parts of the brain these hallucinogens are opening up to connect us to a spiritual connection? Okay, well, I need to start with a disclaimer that I'm not a scientist, and I've only made a cursory or casual study of that per se. First of all, with cannabis, uh, we have uh, something in our bodies called the endocannabinoid system. Uh, endo meaning interior or something like that, okay? It's extensive. Some researchers have said it's the most prevalent uh, receptor system in the human organism. Uh, cannabis itself is an exogenous or exo cannabis or cannabinoid and so it's taken into the body and it meets these ready receptors right so um, we're very our system is very simpatico with cannabis uh, it, it, it these ready receptors are all over in the brain in the nervous system and so on and so on there's no toxicity to this plant there there's a, there's a there's a term called um, LD50 lethal dose 50. It's a medical term and it means the dosage at which 50 percent of the people taking that particular drug will die, right? Um, alcohol has a very definite LD50 of somewhere around 32 ounces in a certain period of time. Um, many people die from ph pharmaceutical drugs taken legally just be for, the, for the same reason. That's uh, for sure, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Can cannabis to all intents and purposes has no LD50. Um, you, it was pretty much <clears throat> functionally or practically impossible to do that kind of harm to yourself. Um, uh, as the folk, uh, great country singer Willie Nelson once said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, the only way you could ever die from cannabis is if a heavy bale of it fell off a truck and crushed you. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> so it's an extremely safe plant that is, is, is very uh, simpatico with the human organism in that regard. Okay? Okay. Um, now, there's been some fascinating research on the, what's going on, you know, the, with all the brain imaging stuff that they're able to do now um, uh, with psychedelics like psilocybin, for example. Uh, and I, I find that stuff really exciting. Uh, one of the presenters at our conference a couple of years ago was a scientist who's, who's working in that area, a neuroscience. She's a neuroscientist. And uh, she threw up pictures on the screen um, on her PowerPoint of the brain uh, uh, with colored lines showing the connections between different parts of the brain and she did have like one image you know of the quote normal or sober brain and beside it is the, uh, uh, the same brain uh, in the, under the influence of psilocybin and there are all these connections happening to different parts of the brain that weren't there before um, so uh, these substances uh, like psilocybin are trip, called tryptamine hallucinogens and right. hallucinogens is not an appropriate word by the way but we can talk about that at another time um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me because hallucin uh, hallucination is considered a pathological experience that's it not is, right. real not real right anyway mm -hmm. um, substances the chemical configuration of psilocybin matches brain chemistry very closely. Um, the most powerful psychedelic on the, uh, on the planet, some people would maybe say uh, another one is slightly more so, that's 5-MeO-DMT, but DMT or dimethyltryptamine is considered right. the most powerful psychedelic on the planet. Um, uh, and uh, it, we have it in our brain chemistry. It exists in the pineal gland. I believe it's pronounced pineal, P-I-N-E-A-L. Yes, right. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Dr. Rick Strassman wrote a book called the DMT, The Spirit Molecule, Molecule, where he speculated, not claiming, you know, for, for sure, but saying that it's very possible that um, uh, an increase uh, of DMT in the pineal gland released into one of the two brain, brain hemispheres is responsible for um, experiences of mystical awakening, like Satori or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, yeah, so so these these substances like uh, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, um, uh, peyote, they're very simpatico with with brain chemistry. They don't leave you. You know, like for example, Datura is not in that category. Datura can leave you rubber need for days on end. I, I oh my told, goodness! You know? Oh yeah, 
And, and many pharmaceutical drugs are not really in that sense simpatico with brain chemistry in that natural way. So in terms of this person's question, uh, these plants are not really that foreign to our brains, I would say, overall. They, they're, mm -hmm. they're safe. It's r rare that there would ever be, I mean, you'd have to take a boatload of peyote to, I mean, you could get certainly be throwing up like crazy if you take a lot of it, you know, if you're not used to it. Um, ayahuasca may have an LD50 at some point, but it's far, far beyond the amount that anyone could handle, you know, <laughs> emotionally or whatever you want to call that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's all fascinating, and it's so interesting that all of this is coming to the forefront now mm -hmm. uh, as, as we're moving towards, let's hope, a more enlightened planet. But also, let's talk a little bit about the fact that, that cannabis has been identified as a feminine aspect, as a feminine spirit. Mm. And I think that's so interesting, and you, you brought it up, it's, it's mentioned a few places in the book, and mm -hmm. I think it, it is a metaphor also in the, in the way that the feminine spirit has been restricted, it has been uh, treated in a way that it needs to be controlled, and certainly cannabis has been treated that way up until recently in mm -hmm. the United States. Not in mm -hmm. other places, but there yeah. is something going on here where now cannabis is becoming more available. You're teaching people how to perceive it as a, a sacrament, as a spiritual ally, and and that's a very different perspective than what is what we've been taught about cannabis being such a horrible plant, being such a dangerous thing. So we're getting out of that whole mindset. But I just love the fact that this is a feminine spirit ally. I think mm -hmm. it's very, very interesting. And does that mean also, Stephen, that it would, as you set your intent for spiritual awakening, it's also going to help you awaken that feminine principle within yourself? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I, uh, I just, if I may, just interject uh, real briefly uh, a comment that might be useful for people to understand the concept of drug because it's such a you know a bandied about word. Uh, I really like the way Terence McKenna talked about that. He said, "A drug is anything that promotes unexamined habitual behavior." So that can be just about anything. It can be television, masturbating, you know, uh, workaholism. Uh, you know, video game playing or a substance of any kind, and cannabis can also be used in in that way as well. So, right. um, but these psychedelics, these entheogenic sub substances, entheogen, by the way, means uh, generating the divine within, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of people prefer that term now to psychedelic. Although that's a good word too; it just means mind manifesting or soul manifesting. Um, so um, uh, I just want to say that that's an important way to think about these substances is that to think of them as spiritual allies if used properly rather than drugs and then um, and and not just cannabis in regard to your question but um, I talked earlier in our conversation about the, the the softening effect you know it's like oh boy how to talk about this briefly um, uh, <laughs> I, here's one. This is just a way of looking at things. Okay, you might okay. say you might say that we're all um, children of God, uh, and that in a sense, uh, this we came to this planet with that potential, but that both in our individual lives, but also over the course of history, the species became increasingly cut off from our true unconditioned nature, and more and more identified with the uh, conditional ego that's always thinking of you know its own survival and all this kind of thing so survival becomes the the dominant way of, of you know dealing with life and that leads to you know hierarchies and power fights and all that so it becomes about power and men had the power for one reason because they were uh, bigger and stronger right and they right. weren't tied they weren't tied down by the childbirth element of things in the same way that women were so for whatever reason 
men came to dominate most cultures, but not all, which is an interesting point in itself. There are matrilineal and matriarchal cultures as well, um, and there are partnership cultures where there's been great respect for women in that regard, and where things just take their natural place. You know, it makes sense that a woman would be around the hearth more because she's, you know, she's the one connected to the children. She can breastfeed them when they're young, etc., etc., etc. Right? So, um, right. but in but in this power dynamic thing. I mentioned earlier, you know, talking about the nature of spiritual awakening. So the opposite of spiritual awakening, in a sense, is ego, which is this, you know, tight package of survival and the stories that we tell ourselves and all that. And it and there's a lot to do with power in all that. And so men have managed to, you know, uh, you know, have that power historically for the most part. Um, and it involves a tightening and a restricting and a toughening, in a sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. And close, closing off energies, a closing off of the, our connection to spirituality. So those qualities have been associated more with women and with the feminine principle altogether. So, um, uh, again, what cannabis can do uh, when you are able to channel that energy is release that tight, bond, bounded quality and uh, open us up to the more uh, heartfelt, in a sense, nurturing. It's like you could nurture the planet almost, you know. You feel our hearts, not afraid to be vulnerable, you know, not afraid to be emotional. You know, it's, isn't it interesting how women cry far more easily than men? You know, why yes. is that, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. And it's, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, very few people are... Are, are are going to you know feel that there's a problem if some if a woman cries but a lot of men feel they can't or they might feel that other men around them crying are weak right you know that's they, it uh, yes yeah mm -hmm. yeah so um so the feminizing i think aspect is that um there have been qualities that are natural to all human beings that have been repressed and there's been a, a, a predominance toward this yang male kind of energies in a sense right but they're yes. the same energies that are that have cut us off from our relationship to spirit and to the world and to the and to the planet altogether and have led us to a crisis point in human history now right so what we what needs to happen arguably is that there needs to be a, a, a rebalancing of the energies of yin and yang of male and female and an allowing of that softness that open-heartedness you know that gentleness that tenderness that sensitivity that connectedness you know that women often have more than men because they've been allowed to in a sense oh yeah it's just you know that's a woman you know yeah, you know uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean. She's going to be yes, weak and emotional. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You're going to yeah. be weak and emotional as a man. You can yeah. face a lot of judgment, self-judgment, and other people's judgment. Absolutely, in that. yeah. So this may give people an opportunity, as you mentioned, to balance both male and female within. And isn't that the big alchemical treatise that we're all facing? And Indeed, yeah. some may never face it because they'll be stuck on in a in a place of total ego but the people who are looking for the spiritual awakening can definitely work responsibly with cannabis and have a good outcome now one yeah. other thing that you and I talked about before is because I've heard this complaint I'm a dream therapist and people have said you know I have mm. I'm using this for my pain or whatever but when I do I cannot remember my dreams and yeah. so you had a good uh, a good answer for that do you remember what you said? Uh, I do. Yeah, I remember the conversation. Uh, yeah, well, you know, part of it is this, what we talked about earlier in the conversation, this notion of frequency of use being an important right. issue. Yeah. Um, there are other issues that, uh, not to distract you from your question, but that uh, if we have time, and I don't think we have much left now, but maybe that's why we need to do another one in a couple of months. Exactly. We yes. never got into talking about issues like dosage and methods of intake, and yes. uh, and those are important issues, um, and also ceremonial use and a few other things that we didn't get into. But mm -hmm. um, in regard to... Um, oh, Sorry, I forgot. Uh, I, I lost well, it for a second. We were talking about yeah. going back to your comment about not using it too frequently. If you use it too frequently, you're going to run dreams. into this it's, problem possibly. It's the dream. Yes. Yeah, it's the dreams question. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and I haven't taken any canvas. So I can't blame. Uh, <laughs> 
I can't blame yeah, my short term. <laughs> I can't term, blame my short term memory loss on that one. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, all I know is anecdotal evidence that a lot of people say that when they smoke cannabis daily, they they don't dream. Uh, so so if you know, if you're having to use it for medicinal benefit, then you're just going to have to live with that, I guess, uh, for the most part, um, because you may need to use it daily. Use cannabis daily. Uh, if you don't need to use it daily and you would like to uh, understand and practice how to use it as a spiritual ally or spiritual medicine, again, uh, a number of people such as some of the contributors to the book, say that less frequently is going to be more effective. Uh, one of the contributors to the book, uh, Mariano da Silva, is a, both an ayahuasca shaman and a cannabis shaman or expert on it as a spiritual medicine. And he says that, said that um, uh, he tries to keep it down to like once a week. Uh, you know, leave five, six, seven days between times, and then it's going to be sharper and deeper when you channel that energy. Uh, and then, you know, you bring some kind of meditative focus in, into it as much as possible. Um, so, yeah, that, that, there's, I, I would guess that if you are able to limit your frequency of use uh, to, you know, sort of every four, five, six days, seven days, uh, then you're more likely to have the dreams come back. Uh, I, in our conversation about that, I mentioned this uh, substance that somebody gave me recently. Um, it happened to be sitting here. I've been using it, actually. Dreams tea. Uh, yeah, it's called Dreams Tea, and it has Damiana, Mugwort, Blue and Pink Lotus, Passionflower, mm -hmm. Lavender, and Spearmint in it. Uh, I've now taken Sounds it... It's delicious. <laughs> I've now take, had a cup of this stuff about an hour before bedtime, four times. I've only had it for about a week and a half. And three of the four times, I definitely had more powerful, meaningful, livelier, more visual dreams than I've been having in recent years. So maybe there are certain kinds of herbal herbs that you know people can take that might counteract that oh, effect it's been, I think that's terrific yeah. it's, it's, nice. I mean, it's something to definitely explore don't you think PK that would be great definitely and I was also thinking about the fact that you're talking about the sensitivity and how it brings us out with everybody we are in a universal two year which deals with sensitivity so people involved with the cannabis are taking it mm -hmm. will they find it they may need less of it this year because the year itself makes them more sensitive mm -hmm. so the intake may be more potent well, you know, that's an interesting question about dosage, then I'll then give me an excuse to talk about that for a minute. Yes. One, of the, one of the themes that comes up in the book repeatedly from different contributors is this notion that less is more. And mm -hmm. Now, less isn't always more, and sometimes more is more, too. But uh, it's not about getting blasted, it's not about escaping in any way, um, and it's not necessarily about creating some sort of sensational experience. It's about, and Joan Bellow talks about this really well, in her chapter it's about retraining ourselves over time because of course the experience fades in a couple of hours right you know you might have this yes, beautiful experience but mm -hmm. you're back to base camp two hours later or whatever so um, it's really about uh, um, recognizing that space having these experiences occasionally relaxing into it and mm -hmm. recognizing that our natural way is to uh, trust the the free flowing movement of energy, so to speak, as I understand it, that's what the Tao, T A W T A O, the Tao um, means. It's sometimes called the watercourse way, like the way wa water will always find the most effortless, effective way to make its way down a mountain. That's right. a kind of a, a metaphor for how we can function by trusting our own. Uh, unconditioned intelligence in the moment and that mm -hmm. requires us to get out of our heads mm -hmm. to a large degree and just relax into it but in terms of uh, this notion of uh, less is more uh, you don't have to have a lot of cannabis to do that it, and especially if you're dealing with the you know the way we're dealing with these super strong uh, you know medicines these cannabis medicines these days a very light dose is a good place to start especially if you're 
you want to find out how much you can stay relaxed and present with because the the bit the higher the dosage the more the ego is potentially threatened and the more you're going to your ego is going to kick up the dust as it were and try to prevent that from happening so your mind can get really busy you can have physical symptoms like dizziness nausea etc you can have panic attacks paranoia can be associated with that all those things are related to our ego being threatened in a sense but that's where our path lies too so you know dosage start with a very small dosage especially if you're not familiar with it uh, and again if you're doing it every day it's different because there's a tolerance effect but if you're doing it in these kinds of ways perhaps you know once every four days or once a week or even less often then start with a very small dose try to be present with it see if you can relax out of your head to some degree and then then maybe try to up the dosage in that regard so Thanks for allowing me to segue into that one, PK. <laughs> no, it's a very important question that needed to be answered, and I'm glad PK asked you that question and you were able to bring it to this because that is always a very important question mm -hmm. that has to be answered. How much do you take? And also then you can go further with what kind of method uh, do you use because there's so many yeah. methods of administering this, whether it's a chocolate candy bar a lozenger, a uh, suppository. I mean, they have all different oh kinds. <laughs> yeah, so no it's like, how do you, you know, how do you decide? But I guess again, everybody's different. You need to use what you're comfortable with. But I love your yeah. advice, uh, Stephen, yeah. to be cautious and to start definitely. small. And it's also, I would imagine, definitely, a lot yeah. less expensive to start. Uh, small. Yeah, definitely <laughs> yes. Um, and also in regard to what PK was saying about, you know, maybe the the veils are thinner this year. Is one way mm -hmm. of putting it, perhaps. I think that could be true as well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and fit into this less is more notion. Because ultimately, you know, what Buddhist and other great traditions would say is this: the awakened state is our natural state. We don't necessarily have to have, um, you know, substances to help us in that regard. It's just that they do tend to open channels up that had been shut down. But um, the more you pay attention, in fact, with ayahuasca, the, the ayahuascaros, the shamans that have been using this uh, substance for many, many years, say they many of them have gotten to the point where they hardly need any of it of to have a, you know, a really powerful experience. You, and in fact, let me just finish off by saying this. Uh, if you, um, uh, there's a, there's a, indigenous people often have this notion that um, uh, a plant can become medicine for you. And it, when it, what they mean, as I understand it, is that when you've developed a, a relationship with that plant, and um, I think ultimately the spirit of that plant, or what Cat Harrison would call the mother of that plant, then you actually have a relationship with the plant that doesn't necessarily require you to take it, to like to smoke it or eat it, you know. In the Native American right. church ceremonies, they sometimes couldn't get the medicine. They have one peyote plant called the chief peyote, and occasionally they would have to just pass it around, and everyone they would have a very powerful experience sometimes. And I can see that we need to, to quit now, right? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately we do. <laughs> yes. But I'm Stephen, going. we're going to have to have you back, because again, you have yeah. so much great information for everybody, a wonderful book that everybody should definitely get on Amazon.com or your local bookstore, Cannabis and Spiritual. Yeah. And that is by Stephen Gray, who's been a wonderful guest tonight. Next week, we're back to aliens. And what are they doing? They are stealing souls. We're going to be talking with someone from the UK who has all the scoop on this. So until then, everybody, we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night. Good night. Good night.